Welcome back, everyone. Let me start by noting that if you have questions for our speakers, please submit them through the Q&A function on Zoom. Our first speaker is Adam Siegel, who is a researcher services librarian here at UC Davis. He's a literary translator who has translated works from Russian, Czech, German, Croatian, Serbian, French, Italian, Swedish, and Norwegian. He was awarded a National Endowment for the Arts Literary Translation Fellowship in 2014. Along with Deatra Cohen, he co-authored Ashkenazi Herbalism, Rediscovering the Herbal Traditions of Eastern European Jews, published by North Atlantic Books last year. The title of his talk is Camellia Sinensis as Medicinal Plant in Eastern Europe. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to ask David to give me a thumbs up if, I, if my audio levels are OK. OK, great. So I'm going to share my screen and start talking. I'm, I'm happy that at this point, two years into the pandemic, I'm able to. Uh, um, OK, great. So T in quotation marks, because we're interested in the um, research that my co-author and I did not just on Camellia sinensis. In fact, Camellia sinensis was only a, a relatively small part of our initial research. Um, we've since delved more deeply into the broader question of health and food in uh, Eastern European uh, Jewish communities uh, up to, up to the, the Second World War and, and, and even beyond. But um, you'll see that we have T in quotes because T can refer to largely, broadly speaking, um, it's necessary to sort of distinguish between the different types of things that we're talking about when we when we discuss um, plant material that we ingest uh, infusions, an herbal remedy prepared by steeping plant material in water. And, and most of everybody here today will will recognize that as a pretty good description of what tea is, remedy or no. It's plant material that's steep, typically the leaves, the berries, the uh, aerial parts of the plant, the stuff that grows above ground. Decoctions are herbal remedies in which plant material, usually hard or woody, bark, roots, rhizomes, etc., are boiled in water and reduced to make a concentrated extract. And then tinctures, herbal remedies are perfumery materials prepared in an alcohol base. Um, but for the most part, um, I, my, my talk is going to center around infusions, um, herbal infusions, um, not just Camellia sinensis, but a broad variety of um, medicinal plants used by um, uh, Eastern European Jews. Um, up to up to the Second World War. So as you uh, are well aware, or you wouldn't be part of this colloquium today. Um, tea has a long and storied history as, as, as part of health and healing remedies um, in traditional Chinese medicine, TCM, but it's also be, been more broadly adopted uh, throughout the world over the course of the last uh, five centuries or so. And you can see this is a classic instance of what we mean when we talk about an infusion. Here are some tea leaves, and they've been placed in a bowl. It's likely hot water, uh, boiling water, to extract, um, um, you know, the the the, uh, the 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 tannins, the the polyphenols, and all the other good stuff that we find in in the Camellia sinensis. So the project at hand. Um, our book, which was published last year, was really um, meant to uncover a tradition that had been lost. Um, my co-author, uh, when she uh, went to study clinical herbalism in a sort of a Western tradition, uh, one of the exercises new students were uh, asked to engage in was find out a bit more about their own ancestral knowledge. Um, but, uh, you know, which is, which is easy enough if you've been raised with TCM or Ayurvedic medicine or even, um, Europe, uh, uh, European, Western European herbal traditions or uh, Native American indigenous peoples of the Americas traditions. Uh, but as an Ashkenazi Jew, my co-author um, said, well, I don't know of anything. <laughs> what do we have? And then a, a classmate said, well, at least we have chicken soup. And she said, there's got to be more to it than chicken soup. Um, and so because uh, before she became an herbalist, she was also a librarian, um, the two of us. Um, embarked on a, a, a journey to search for um, what traditions we could find from um, our own uh, Eastern European uh, Jewish ancestors. 
Um, what the broad discoveries that we did make when we did find lots and lots of stuff, hence the book, um, is that the uh, Materia Medica um, for uh, Ashkenazi Jews is based largely on native plants of Eastern Europe, what they call the Pale of Settlement, which is where Jews were permitted to live under the Russian Empire. It extends broadly from, say, Warsaw as far as a little bit beyond Minsk from west to east, from Riga in the north, the Black Sea in the south. And we also did a lot of comparative analysis, significant but not uniform overlap with herbal medicinal practices and traditions of neighboring populations, uh, such as Poles, Ukrainians, Belarusians, Lithuanians, Hungarians, Romanians, Roma, Tatars, etc. But we actually were lucky enough to come across a skeleton key. We went through the literature. We did massive, exhaustive reviews of the literature and all the library catalogs and databases known, known, to, known, to, known, known to humankind. Um, anthropological literature, clinical literature, uh, Judaica, et cetera. I mean, there was a certain amount of stuff on plants in the Bible and things like manna from heaven. What could that be? What's bitter wormwood in the context of the Old Testament? But there was very little that we could find that pointed to a population that was around 10 million people before the Second World War and what uh, plant medicinal traditions they had while living cheek by jowl with, um, um, with a, lot of, a lot of other ethnic groups that had fairly well documented um, traditions, one of which is uh, the monograph that we found here, Herbs Used in Ukrainian Folk Medicine, published just after the Second World War by a Ukrainian nomen botanical nomenclature specialist. Um, it was published in, as a mimeograph out of Columbia, um, and it was co-sponsored co co by the New York Botanical Garden. And it um, is a it's material that was derived from ethnographic expeditions conducted in Ukraine in the 20s and 30s by the Soviet government um, as part of a broader initiative to improve their domestic stock of um, their domestic pharmacology because of power, you know, restrictions, embargoes, you know, lack of trade deals, lack of convertible currency. Um, it was difficult for the Soviet government, especially after the revolution, to import import uh, you know pharm uh, pharmaceuticals from abroad um, and because there was um, not only a an awareness that um, there was a vast array of plant you know medicinal plants um, across the length and breadth of the Soviet Union thanks to a fairly robust uh, ethnographic ethnobotanical bent that dated back to the mid 19th century and, um, a, a ongoing reliance on, on, on folk medicine and sort of non-clinical practitioners in much of the Soviet Union. Um, they got together farms, you know, far, uh, ethnobotanists, uh, social anthropologists, um, plant pathologists, et cetera, and sent them out on expeditions to go into the villages and talk to people and find out what they used, what plants they relied on and what they relied on them for. So this was sort of part of a triangulation project to see what was happening in the Pale of Settlement before the Second World War. And then at the end of the research, it wasn't. I was. It was interesting, but there was. There was. There. There was. Uh, we were still sort of casting around. And my co-author one day she noticed at the the back of this book, around page one, one ten, and you can see it's typescript, um, had an index of all the towns where um, the informants for the, this, the, this, these surveys. There were about 10 of them that were conducted between like 1927 and 1939. So right up to the eve of the Second World War. And um, she said, well, I'm gonna see what these towns are like. Who lived there? What's going on in these various towns? I'm stuck. And um, a very quick perusal by about the fifth town, just searching them on the internet. You know, The first internet hits that came up were from sites like Jewish Gen, Yad Vashem, Shtetl Finder. And uh, she quickly determined that we were looking at uh, informants that came from towns that in some cases had a pre-war Jewish population of 90%. So it was very, very likely statistically that any given informant um, in certain towns was likely to be Ashkenazi Jewish and that the folk traditions that they were um, discussing 
with the uh, researchers were probably representative. And in fact, um, in the, the front matter to this book, the author does state that these were, you know, these were all consistent with their findings were consistent with 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 um, um, traditional knowledge of, of, of medicinal plant use in, in, in the region. Um, so we mapped it out, and the, the, the this is um, the, the 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 red and orange indicate higher uh, pre-war Ashkenazi Jewish populations, and you can see that the pale of settlement line is is, is demarcated by the Dnieper River right there in the middle of Ukraine, south of Kiev to the flowing into the Black Sea. So these are all the towns that were the sites of um, this ethnographic research between the wars, with um, their percentage of Jewish populations anywhere from less than 25 up to, you know, 80, 90 percent. And that led us to look at more broadly. Uh, there was not just that was there was not just that this ethnographic research. There actually had been a large ethnographic survey of um, uh, Eastern European Jews conducted in Russia before the First World War, the so-called Ansky expeditions. And this was the program in, in, in Russian and, and, and Yiddish. And it was a very, very, very elaborate questionnaire uh, that was meant to elicit information on all manner of things from childbirth, rituals, riddles, uh, folk sayings, uh, customs, habits, everything there was to know about the lives of um, Jews living in the Palo settlement on the eve of the First World War, including, you know, how do you treat a wound? What's the best remedy for this? What do you call this type of treatment, etc.? And we were able to sort of confirm some of the findings that we'd found by looking at this work, by comparing it to an earlier generation of ethnographic research. And in fact, one of the interesting details we discovered was that many of the towns that were visited in the 20s and 30s were the exact same towns that ethnographers had visited in 1912, 1913, probably because, you know, successive generations of ethnographers had noted that, you know, there were towns that had lots and lots of good informants. So um, this, this expedition is certainly, um, you know, on the, the right bank or Western Ukraine, um, mimicked, mirrored, and followed in the footsteps of this earlier, earlier survey. And um, so the information that was contained therein, um, my co-author made a, it was a, we couldn't really figure out, handle a spreadsheet that big. So we took graph paper and you can see the scale. Um, the, uh, the, the, the left, you know, the, 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 the column, the, the left-hand co uh, column is the, the, all the plants. And then the, uh, the, the row at the top is all the towns. And you can't really see it. You have X's where plant usage was recorded in a, in a certain town. And it and also there's information on the towns and their population. Their, excuse me, their um, pre-war uh, percentage of the population that was Jewish. And um, this was a way we sort of track plant usage, uh, medicinal plant usage in the region. And here were some of the the, the large infusions. We've got to talk inf about infusions. We're here to talk about tea. And some of the plants, especially these were plants that anybody who will look in the contemporary uh, sort of clinical approach to uh, medicinal plant usage, you know, um, I, I, I actually selected these by, by reviewing them in PubMed to make sure that these were all plants that had recently been subject to literature reviews to determine their efficacy. Um, some Phytum officinale, comfrey, um, violet, St. John's wort, wild carrot, wormwood, uh, chicory, uh, knotweed, um, plantain, chamomile, uh, etc. And so these are all plants that were widely used as infusions, not just as decoctions or tinctures, but they were they, the, the plant material, the above ground aerial material, the leaves, the berries, etc. Were, were, were either brewed in, in boiling water or cold infused, and then given to uh, a patient to treat an illness. But here are some of the plants that we actually covered in the book, along with the remedies that were most widely used by Ashkenazi Jewish healers before the, before the, the, the Second World War. Um, wormwood was used as the whole plant infusions were treated, used to treat head colds, coughs, and chest pains. Chicory, root decoctions, uh, treated diarrhea. A wild strawberry, leaf and root infusions treated whooping cough in children. St. John's wort infusions treated women in labor. 
tree mallow infusions treated cold sy symptoms. This was such a widely used mallow, both tree mallow and malva, um, plain old mallow, the mallow plant. Um, in Yiddish, God is known as the Eibersteh, the supreme one pronounced as Eibersteh, which is uh, also the Yiddish word for mallow tea, Eibersteh. So the person who was a little sick is told that the Eibersteh would help them. So that was a nice little pun that we're attentive to and made sure we included, <laughs> included in the book. Pepperwort infusions were used to treat mal malaria. Water lily infusions, along with black locust tree, um, were used to treat hemorrhages. Peony infusions were used as remedies against leucorrhea or to induce menstruation. Plantain infusions were used as remedies against bloody diarrhea, hemorrhage, menorrhea. Uh, raspberry infusions, along with chamomile, were used as remedies against hepatitis. Chamomile, Matricaria chamomile, was also very common infusion um, with along with other herbs for colds, etc. Red clover, whole plant teas treated in digestion, white clover, flower infusions induced menstruation. And who were the healers? Uh, we actually did um, put together a, 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 a typology of, of folk healers in the towns and villages of the Pale of Settlement. Um, for the longest time, uh, medical care was dominated. And when I say the longest time from May, the early 18th century into the mid 19th century, it was dominated by what they call Baal Shem, masters of the name who were practical Kabbalists who um, typically relied on remedy books that it contained um, a mixture of remedies derived as far back as Dioscorides and Galen or Maimonides, because they were coming from the Jewish tradition, and also um, even some Paracelsian alchemical traditions. And they were sort of stock handbooks that are, were in wide distribution in the, in the region, um, usually in Hebrew, but sometimes in Yiddish. Uh, medical care, particularly in the smaller towns and villages of all types, not just uh, Jewish shtetls or Jewish villages, but um, you know, towns of any, you know, of, of a, that were too small to su say support a, 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 a trained doctor relied heavily on felchers who were uh, mili often military paramedics and, you know, they were either got their training on the battlefield, you, you were sort of descendants of the old barber surgeon from the Middle Ages, or they later on were certified. And in fact, the felcher is still a, a really important paramedic for medical care, especially in re 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 rural parts of Russia. Akusherkes, and this is the Yiddish word for a trained midwife. And then midwives, quote, untrained midwives, or, you know, traditional midwives, and Yiddish bobes, grandmothers. And these midwives, or exorcists, also called bobes, or obstreperants, were among the most important women healers, um, and the most important healers, period, especially in towns that didn't, you know, where, where all reproductive care was, in, was, was, was the responsibility of, um, of, um, of, 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 of women from the community. And they provided the largest single resource for us as we went through and sort of delved more deeply in sort of the culture and society and healing cultures that sort of persisted in, 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 in the region for, 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 for many centuries. And what was a type, the type of ailments? Remember, these are infusions, they're not topicals. They are usually, they were, the whole point of an infusion was that somebody could drink it, which meant that, um, um, poisonous plants, which were part of the Materia Medica, were, were used sparingly, if at all, or were only applied topically, uh, or were subject to uh, being tinctured or decocted uh, because they were just too toxic to be ingested. But broadly speaking, um, pl herbal plant infusions were most likely um, applied for types of bleeding, whether internal, hemorrhaging, menorrhea, leucorrhea, pre, peri, or postnatal discharges. Um, respiratory illnesses such as coughs, colds, and congestion. Fevers, it's febrifuges, influenza or malarial fever, sometimes even um, uh, yellow fever. Um, intestinal parasites, worms and such. Um, broadly speaking, digestive problems, gas, stomach aches, indigestion, diarrhea, kidney problems, urinary tract infections, and then a broad set of nervous complaints, anxiety, fear, just not feeling right. Um, most of us who, who, who spend any time drinking tea will know that it's much more pleasant to uh, have tea when you're feeling anxious than say a cup of coffee or even um, a glass of wine. Although I think I'm 
right on the right on the uh, the the the, uh, the precipice about which one I like better. But T, I feel like I've just been sort of a beta switch with this talk, where we've talked a lot about infusions and plant infusions and plant medicine, but we've hardly talked at all about Camellia sinensis. And there's a reason for that, because Camellia sinensis was is a relatively recent introduction to the region. It was, quote, introduced to Russia, the court of the Tsar, in the early 17th century, likely via uh, the Mongolian Khanate, which at the time extended from just north of China to the Ural Mountains. Um, I suspect, I'm looking into it, we're looking into the, the Camellia sinensis was known north of the Black Sea via the Caucasus from Iran, probably at a much earlier date because uh, Iran um, had a, a taken, you know, and was cultivating um, Camellia sinensis uh, uh, in, at least in the 15th century, the Venetians encountered that trade. Um, but by the 18th century, Camellia sinensis largely supplanted and augmented uh, traditional local hot slash cold in infusions, such as Uzvar, which is uh, like compote, dried fruits and berries, and Spiten, which was a, a brew made from honey and herbs, such as ginger, sage, St. John's wort, cinnamon, nutmeg, etc. But Camellia sinensis, where does it actually show up? We did find a fair amount of material. We didn't find it in sort of the clinical stuff. We didn't find it in the compendia of medicinal plants as they're used in the former Soviet Union. We found it in sort of oral histories, documentary evidence. Um, you know, people in our own lives testified that one particular remedy, um, not just tea and honey, but tea and raspberry specifically, as a compound infusion, either raspberry, if you could have fresh raspberries, wonderful, if not a little raspberry jam, was it has was and has been a traditional panacea for childhood illness, sort of the St. Joseph's children as, children's aspirin of the shtetl. And here are some quotes from the book that sort of underscore what we in our own lives documented, um, such as a folk healer who took care of sick children in Tishovitz in near Tishovce, Poland, uh, which is about 50 miles away from um, uh, my co-author's grandparents' town. Uh, Aunt Gittel was beloved by her young patients because, quote, she always prescribed the same remedy, a teaspoon of berry juice and lots of tea. And an Aisha Shock, which is in Lithuania, Hyya Sorella Lubetsky's daughter, Batya, for example, still swore by her mother's cure for hepatitis, a drink made of ground up raspberry vines, dandelions, carrot, and followed by a fresh drink of fresh chamomile infusion. So we're sort of seeing a nexus of camp Metricaria chamomile camellia sinensis and raspberry, especially for children's ailments, which we want to look at more deeply, um, which is part of where the project is going next. Now that the book is out, um, we'd like to pursue the documentary record, the memory books that were published after the war by survivors of the Holocaust, you know, Yiddish and Hebrew, the Iskor books, memoirs, oral histories, local histories, ethnographies for references and recipes, incorporating Camellia sinensis infusions. And that includes looking not just at Jewish populations, but at Russian and Ukrainians, everybody in the region, to the extent to which, you know, the Camellia sinensis usage is not just, you know, the samovar and the sugar cube between your teeth, but is actually incorporated into folk medicinal um, materia medica. And then also look in more greater detail, the modes, modes, means, and timelines of transmission of plants and plant knowledge from east to west. There's a lot of tantalizing references to early use of um, plants found um, in east and southeast and south Asia and the means by which they got there via the Silk Route, maybe, the Siberia through the Caucasus from India, the Near East, such as Galangal, ginger, Panax or Siberian ginger, uh, nutmeg, and cinnamon, as well as plants of the Black Sea region, such as sea buckthorn and, and uh, calamus root. So that's where we're going next. I think I'm probably at time, and I'm going to wrap it up here and turn, turn everything back over to David. So thank you very much for for, for, for your attention. I look forward to answering your questions along with my co-presenter, Renee, um, when she's finished. So thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. For those who are just arriving, allow me to reiterate that if you have questions for our speakers, please submit them through the Q&A function on Zoom. Our speakers, our speakers will address these questions after the following presentation has finished. Our next speaker is Dr. René Bédard, who is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education at Western University in London, Ontario. Um, I don't know if you anglicize your, your French name or not. Uh, <laughs> okay, good. Um, 
Uh, Professor Bedao's publications include Indian in the Cupboard, Lateral Violence, and Indigenization of the Academy, published by Springer. Her talk is titled, and I am just winging the pronunciation of some of this, so please be tolerant, Anibi Shabo, an, Anishina, an Anishinaabe Woman's Cultural Perspective on, women, on Women's Teas. So um, miigwech for that. That was an excellent pronunciation of both the French and the Nishinaabe Moen uh, pronunciation of the words. I'm, I'm very impressed. My, my French Canadian father would be like, yes, yes. Um, so miigwech for that, which means thank you. I, I feel a little bit of a different kind of fish in a pond of fish. And I feel like I'm a little off with all the medical experts, but after hearing Adam speak and also hearing Eric, Zoe and Gabrielle speak, I felt a little bit better because I take my positionality with my relationship with tea a little bit different. I just probably should make this bigger for you. It comes from cultural uh, perspective and very much grounded in a sense of looking at tea within the holistic uh, mind, body, spirit, and emotional connections that I hold uh, to tea and that my culture um, has taught me to think of tea. And it's not necessarily from scientific training because that is not my background in any way. And throughout my presentation, I'm going to have different um, plant medicines, as I will refer to them, that are used for tea, and um, that the women in my culture will use for tea. And this entire presentation is very much grounded and centered in the notion of I view tea as, as a woman, and, and that's how I will um, kind of talk about that. This particular plant is known and you might know it. Um, some of you might not. It's, it might be a bit obscure. Uh, it's in English, Labrador tea plant. And uh, in Nishinaabe Moen is uh, Mashkiko bug, uh, uh, a Nishabo. And the Nishabo is the tea, but Mashkigo, Mashkigo uh, speaks to the medicine of the plant, but it also speaks to the location that where it's found. It's a swamp plant the swamp tea. And um, so it's a very powerful plant. And when we think about it, we think about it in our in its relationship to its ecosystem. This tiny little plant is important because in the springtime when the hummingbirds come back and they make their nests, they they scrape using their little beaks all the uh, fluff that's on the underside of the Labrador tea plant. And they use that to line their, their little nests. And they do that because it has antibacterial qualities and it has protective qualities for their young ones and those eggs and then those tiny little birds. I don't know if baby birds have a name, <laughs> but the tiny baby birds. And um, so it's a very special plant. And when we think about the way that bird approaches that plant, we kind of mimic that in our lives as mothers, that we use it to create teas to protect our families. And that antibacterial quality, um, antimicrobial quality of this plant allows to protect us from things like the coughs that come with living in Northern climates. For example, in my home community this week, the temperatures got down to, and let me think about this, in Fahrenheit would have been, I think, 47 point, minus 47.2. <laughs> that is really low. In Celsius, it's minus 44. So you think about living in that cold cli climate, you develop coughs and possibly fevers. And this Labrador tea helps us. Um, so I speak from that cultural perspective. I speak to... Uh, the relevance of plants in the lives of my people and my family. And I, I have put a picture here of Gijik. Nokomis Gijik is the grandmother cedar, and she is one of those most very special plants when European explorers showed up on the shores of North America suffering from um, one of the words 
is uh, escaping me. It's not, it's the lack of vitamin C from going over months and months and months on the water. They started getting really, really sick. And when they showed up at the shores, the people shared this medicine. So cedar carries vitamin C that helps you. And in, in wintertime at this, starting around this time of the year, leading into February, um, this is the time of the year that we will make cedar tea because it gives you that little bit of boost from the vitamin C in that plant. You can take a couple sprigs or you can put it in a pot and just aerate your house and it cleans that lovely smell that comes with winter time where your windows are closed up and it depends what part of the country and continent that you are on. But in uh, Northern Ontario, you, you want to clean the air in your house. So, um, so I want to introduce myself in a good way, and I'm going to begin in the language of my people. So, Bojo and Dinawe, Maganaduk. Greetings to all my human relatives. Nishinabe, Gayankahaga, Menowawamtakozi, and I am Nishinabe Mohawk and French Canadian. My name in Nishinabe Moen is Woman Who Paints Like the Sky or Painted Sky Woman. My clan is the Martin clan, Wabajeshi and Dondem. Oki Kandat, Menacing and Donjaba. My traditional territory is Doki's First Nation, also known as the Island of the Cauldrons or the Kettle Pots, which is this really weird phenomenon where one rock sits above another rock. And over time, probably thousands of years, <laughs> well, the, the rock on the top due to wind and water starts to rotate a little bit and carve the rock underneath till eventually a sphere is developed and it's considered sacred. Uh, Ninamin Wendam. Um, I am happy for all things that have brought me here. And that phrase means that I acknowledge my ancestors and all that they have lived through, all that I have experienced in my life to bring me to this moment to speak to you here today. And I share with you one of my favorite plants in the entire world is wild blueberries. And the leaves we make tea from, and also the berries, because they have a wide variety of benefits, not only the vitamins like vitamin C, um, vitamin K, um, there's all sorts of other things like uh, potassium and manganese um, and fiber in those leaves. But the berries themselves are, are always lovely. And uh, so miigwech for having me here today. I want to give some context too to what is Anishinaabe territory for most of you who don't understand. Um, when I think of territory too, I think of all of, of North America as being the inheritance of the indigenous peoples of this um, continent we call Turtle Island as indigenous peoples. But Anishinaabe territory is huge, stretching all the way from uh, the province of Quebec in Canada, Ontario, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan, uh, across several of the states in the US, uh, including Wisconsin, Minnesota, even North Dakota. And so, and Michigan, I think I forgot Michigan. That is a vast territory. And so when I speak to that, I speak to all the plants that are across that territory. One of the things I think is really important to do is to acknowledge uh, the lands with which UC Davis University are upon. Um, <clears throat> the Putwin, I think is how you pronounce it, peoples and their communities. And to acknowledge the, <clears throat> the legacy of colonization um, that they have survived and that they still continue to live through, but also to know that all of that land, to acknowledge that land is very important. I currently am residing on Nishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Lenape, and Chinatan people's traditional territories on the lands of the London Township and the Somber Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. I am the great, great, great granddaughter of Michael Eagle Dokis, who is a signatory of the Robinson Huron Treaty of 1850. And I, I want to thank you and I, I acknowledge uh, these traditional lands that while we are not on physically, we are on virtually. Um, in terms of who I am as an academic, uh, I think uh, while I don't hold that honestly as important as the, the cultural side of me, uh, I 
as said before, I come uh, from Western University in Lennon, Ontario, Canada, and I teach Indigenous education in the Faculty of Education. So I'm responsible for teaching teachers how to walk into classroom and be respectful towards Indigenous cultures and Indigenous peoples. I'm not a specialist in any way. I'm just an Anishinaabe woman who carries the knowledge of the grandmothers and elders that come before me, uh, my mother, my grandmother, and all those um, knowledge keepers that have shared knowledge with me over the years. And so that is where I speak from. I speak as a woman and I especially speak as a mother and that is my worldview. The reason that I wanted to present here was to share Indigenous perspectives. And it's been really fascinating to listen to everyone's presentations today, some perspectives being embedded in Western traditions, some folkloric traditions, some um, Eastern traditions. And I guess I get to be the one who presents from some Indigenous perspectives as well. And when I think of the, the plants that we are speaking about today, those are considered my relatives. Those are beings that I have responsibilities to. Indigenous peoples have learned to adapt to our environments over thousands of years living in specific geographic ecosystems and locations. And we have even uh, adopted and named uh, many European plants. So when Adam put his presentation up uh, and had started listing off different plants, I was like, well, we, we have names for those too. Even though we, we recognize that they've come over as part of the legacy of colonization, what we do is we adopt those plants. And for example, thinking of beadwork, the glass beads of European explorers brought over from the glass makers of Italy that made these tiny little seed beads that can make these more intricate patterns. And we adopted it into our, our cultures because they didn't threaten the integrity of our cultures. They allowed our traditions to continue. And so there are many plants that we use as teas to make tea, to construct tea that have been transplanted over, but so they have become adopted family in a way. And in our creation stories, plants were created before human beings. So they are considered the grandmothers and grandfathers. They are the Gichiyayag. They are the elders that came before. And so they give us some of the most um, important knowledge that we can use to survive well on the land. And we are told that in the original uh, instructions set out by our creator, Gijimenado, plants volunteered themselves to sacrifice themselves, their lives and their beings to the well being and education of human beings of how to live a good way on this land, Manoba Mazuan, that good life, that good way of living as a human being. And so that relationship is very valuable to us. And so when I think about tea, it's a ceremony of life and living. The ceremony of tea making is really about honoring that relationship, those laws that get you not going to get one on, those laws, those plant laws that say you must, if you are going to take this life, do it in a good way. And so these are some of the the points that I will review as I go along. Every day has small ceremonies or rituals of how we make our way through this world. Tea making, the ceremony of tea making is as special as um, the ceremony of making food, the ceremony of harvesting uh, food or hunting for food or um, there's many ceremonies, but what it is about is about learning to appreciate our place as human beings in the wider scheme of this earth. We are only human beings on this earth. We are not human beings outside of that earth. 
we start to change physically. They've done different studies by NASA of actually human DNA starting to change once we leave this earth. And so when I think of T, I think it's about that connection that we have with our earthly being and our connection to the land and our connection to this earth. A key is what we call her, that first mother in creation, her ability to create life, nourish life, provide for that life, sustain us and welcome us back when we pass. And all of that is in this cycle of creation. One of the main points of tea and one of the first things that we do before we even drink tea, make tea, is we think about our purpose and intention. And we teach our, our young women, you know, when we go and, and harvest those plants, before we even do that, we have to understand what is our connection to the land. We have to understand that our laws are gichi and naka negewanan tell us to do no harm. And it doesn't mean that you're not taking that plant's life, but you have to think of your actions in this larger scale. You don't do harm to the ecosystem. There must be a balance. You don't take all of that plant. You have to be very specific in how you navigate your movements and your actions in that larger ecosystem. What do you need? You don't need all of it. That would be irresponsible. But what do you actually need to make the tea that you're going to make? Is, and you have to judge, is your need so great that you are willing to take that life of that plant, our relative in creation, that independent living being? Because that is what you are either taking a piece of that plant or you're taking the life of the plant. Do we know how to use that plant correctly? And what do we know about this plant? Do you know it's the right plant to choose? What is the information you know that you're going to use that plant for? Who is that plant? That plant has an identity. It has a function within the scheme of creation. We don't just pick a plant and then learn about it, bring it home after you've taken it and examine it. You get to learn that plant. You go out and you sit on the lap of your mother, the earth and you get to know that plant, you look around it and see what's next to it. Who relies on that plant to survive? Do you have knowledge to carry out the harvesting of that plant in a good way? And is it the right time of year to even be taking it? Sometimes it has to be the right time of the month, depending on when the, the moon is moving around, can impact the actual, um, not only spiritual potency of the plant, but sometimes even the physical potency of the plant. You know, is the plant too young? Is the plant too old? You need to know all of these things before you take it. And that helps you build that relationship with that plant and starting to under, understand that tea is more than something you buy at the store. It, it's, it's a relationship you have with this earth. And for many of us in North America, when we think about trying to understand what does it mean to be Canadian? What does it mean to be American? Oftentimes it ends up being some more like surface level thing, but it has to, it, when we really think about it, it's with the land. The land is where our food comes from. The land is actually the originator of our medicines. And so starting to build that relationship more than I can just buy something and not knowing what's in it, not knowing where that plant lives, not having any relationship to it is really you know, I think it's really important we have those things. That's a human thing to do. And when I think of people like Adam's work, he's trying to hunt some of that down. You know, what is that connection those people had with those plants? So choosing the plant, your choice of plant that you're going to take is really important. And knowing that plant from a female perspective, uh, a male perspective, and I, I'm saying female gender spectrum. And when I say genders, it's multi-genders. Indigenous peoples recognize that those who identify on the female gender spectrum and those who identify on the male gender spectrum is there's quite a diverse gender spectrum. It's not, not like 
just one, two genders and how children will harvest and how elderly people will harvest and relate to that plant is very different. Um, and so those things need to be taken into account. We need to know the correct plant to harvest. And if, if I'm sure, we, we never go and harvest a plant without either an elder or an, a traditional knowledge keeper or a, a medicine woman or a medicine man, whatever term you would like to refer to them, but those people that are knowledgeable of plants. And they will make sure that you know where it is, what does it look like, what grows around it, what uses that plant, what is, 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 what is it used for, that's a mouthful, how to harvest it ethically and culturally, and making sure that you are accountable to the other relations in that ecosystem. So for example, chickweed, if I were to harvest chickweed, chickweed has like umpteen amount of birds and insects that rely on that plant. The white-tailed deer uses it. There's mice that use it. The little sparrows use it. All sorts of insects like butterflies, moths, beetles, all survive on that plant. So if I were to go in there in a patch and take the entire patch, that means that animals in that area can't have that. And that's that goes against ethical parameters for harvesting. And so we try to bring a knowledge keeper with it, us, especially if it's our first time. When we prepare, we prepare our harvest tools. And so if I'm going to harvest dodo shabo, uh, sorry, I have to take a running leap at this word sometimes, dodo shabo jibik <laughs> is a dandelion. If I'm going to harvest that, I need. Um, like I gotta have something that I'm gonna dig down. I gotta have a knife or scissors. I gotta have um, sometimes mitts for my hands. Digging in the dirt can, uh, well, sometimes feel good for someone like me. I've, I've had an infection twice from gardening. So I always have to make sure I have some sort of gloves to protect my hands so I, I don't uh, get sick and have to treat it with other stuff. But I have to make sure that every item that I bring to is clean. Even though I might be digging in the dirt, I don't want to transfer bacteria or anything to a plant that I'm cutting, whether it's, you know, a, a flower or a sprig of cedar or anything. You have to make sure that you are using clean stuff if you are harvesting for tea. If you're harv harvesting for ceremony, then you have to make sure that your uh, plants or your tools are, are you know, prepared in a good way. We also bring first aid supplies in case anyone gets hurt, um, especially ourselves. And we uh, never go out collecting any sort of plant medicine in the bush if we are, um, alone. We don't go out alone because that's, that is not a good place to be. You can very much hurt yourself. I just realized my watch died. And so I'm like panicking because I don't know what time it is. So if I talk over, please, someone stop me. <laughs> um, tell someone where you are going and because it's, you know, it's easy to get lost out there and get hurt. Um, so it's, it, I think that's really, really key. One of the things before we even enter into a forest setting um, where we might be going is one of the practices that we do, especially when we think of it as practicing ceremony is to uh, thank the land, thank that earth that gives us that, those, those plants. And it can be as simple as saying, thank you, chi miigwech. Um, but we also kind of up it a little bit, um, knowing that the land itself is giving us something today, not just the plant, but the land. And so we give Sema, which is tobacco, ceremonial tobacco. It's not smoking tobacco for like cigarettes or anything. This is something very specific. And um, so we give some of that. We give that as an offering. Um, to level out the balance of things. You don't take something with not, without giving something. 
or we use Kinnick Kinnick, which is a mixture of plant medicines. And it can vary depending on the user. Often the base is cedar, um, bearberry, um, mullein. Now Kinnick Kinnick is also used in our pipes, our sacred pipes, so that can have quite an effect on whoever's carrying it. But it's, it's a mixture of those plants that mean something to the carrier of it, the one that's going to offer it. So it can have everything, anything. But if it's smoked in a pipe, that's different because you're going to be inhaling it. But uh, uh, an offering of kinnikinik can be very, very personal experience for the person uh, creating it. We thank the earth, we thank the forest, we thank all our relatives in creation for allowing us to come onto their territory. And we think of that forest area as their territory. We have no right to go into their territory without permission and to take something from that that close community of relations. And we thank them for their great sacrifice for us and the promise not to take too much. And we tell them that we honor and um, honor them and honor their laws because we are going into their space. And, but we have responsibilities to honor the laws with which they live by the laws that guide their movements, their growth patterns, their life cycles, their mission that they have to fulfill that predates even human existence. Plants were here, despite, you know, whether you're thinking about it spiritually or not, plants were here before human beings were here. They are the oldest beings that we have on this earth. And so their laws predate human laws. And so we honor that as Anishinaabe people. And this is one of those plants, low bush cranberries, that I remember, oh, I remember as a child having to, to pick. And cranberries, for most of you probably already know, has you know, very uh, specific qualities of helping your urinary system and um, I remember harvesting that and you'd harvest it in the fall when it was really wet and you'd go out on the boat to the islands and, and hope you didn't fall out of the boat because as soon as you put your foot out of the boat, there's usually moss or something and you're gonna get a soaker. Like I would just, re just like cringe and because it was coming. And I remember it being one of the hardest plants that you have to work for just because of the conditions you'd have to harvest these things in. And there'd only be like a handful in one area and you'd got to go to another place and pick that handful. And it would take you forever to fill a basket. And I remember bringing a basket one fall. I was littler and I was a little girl bringing it my, to my great aunt, Albina. And she was like, oh, thank you. And she just put it on her, on her counter. And I remember my mom and all of us like sitting there. It took a lot of work. And it's just a little thank you, but I know it meant a lot to her in the scheme of things, but I'm like, oh, we had to work real hard for those berries, and, but they're medicine. They're medicine we brought to our elders. And that's, that's really what, at the end of the day, um, she would use that to maintain her health. So tied along with that offering of Samaw's introductions, we always introduce, as I introduced myself at the beginning in a good way, to everyone in the language of my people. Introductions are very, very important. I did a land acknowledgement at the beginning because I always acknowledge the land first. The land is everything. I need the land to survive. We all need the land to survive. So we introduce ourselves, we clarify our intention. Who are we responsible to? Why are we there that day? Who are we gonna answer to? We answer to those plants for sure. But we answer to creation, we answer, answer to our clans, we answer to our communities and our elders. And we inform that plant of our intentions. One of the sweetest plants is mint. And I remember when I was pregnant uh, with my first daughter, Willow, I, was, uh, I had two midwives from the Six Nations Birthing Center, Six Nations of the Grand River. And um, they're a, a local First Nations community here in London, Ontario, Canada. And one of the plants that they gave me, uh, a pregnancy mixture of plants had raspberry leaf, had red clover, it had nettle, and one of them was also mint. 
and mint is used by our women and I use it all the time too um, as being one of those plants that you know that kind of supports you it it, it, it kind of is a comforting thing. Most people are comforted by the smell of mint and it wraps its arms around you and it really welcomes you. And it's, it, you know, you get this feeling, it's like, I'm gonna take care of you. And that's why I, I brought a picture of it today because it really is like that. It's like a relative that really wants to take care of you. We ask permission of that plant. And one of the big things with permission is like, you can ask for permission. You wait for that sign, you see a movement of that plant. And then it's like, yes, you can take that plant. But sometimes the you are denied permission and you have to accept that. And that can be a very humbling thing because that plant has rights. You do not have the right to take that plant. And if it does not acknowledge that otherwise you are colonizing that plant, you could be hurting that plant, you could be hurting the ecosystem with which it dwells in. And it might not be the right time of year, month, day for that plant to be harvested. So it's a warning. And um, we have to abide by that. We make an offering to that plant, we place it at the feet of that plant, and we do it in a humble way. We only use the best offerings for that plant. We might not have much. Maybe we'll have a tiny pinch of Sema, but that's enough if it's done in a good way. And that's what we will take. We will take in a good way. We will won't take too much. And we try to give our best. And we understand that we have responsibilities and, du and duties to the, to the grandchildren of that plant. That plant has a right to pass on its knowledge and its life to its children and grandchildren. And we always think as Nishnabe of seven generations ahead. And so we think of those, those seven generations of children and grandchildren. And then we promise that plant that we will protect its rights, we will protect its territory, and we will protect its grandchildren. We will see that through so that that plant is carried on, it survives. Now, I, Adam mentioned the wild strawberries. Wild strawberries grow you know, across the world and they are wonderful things. I love picking them, but they are work. <laughs> and, but that tiny little berry, and it's usually tiny, it's like the tip of your finger sometimes, has more taste and more power. You know, it's called the heart berry, oh day. You know, re reference the heart, the creator. And we have stories about that, those strawberries. I was a little boy transformed in the, into this berry. And so it has great, great power. And um, it has a lot of meaning to our women because we actually have berry ceremonies for our young women when they hit puberty. And they have to abstain from eating those berries for a year, which is hard for anybody not to eat a berry for a whole year. But you, you learn, your, learn to honor yourself as a woman and what your body represents to you as a woman. And so you can't have probably even like you can have some little berries in your tea, you could probably have the berry leaves. Um, and that's actually very beneficial. When we harvest, we try not to take the first one. We try to look around. If it's a big patch, you know, we can kind of look around and ask permission of that whole patch, which ones to take. But if it's one single plant in the forest, we try to walk around a while and see if we can see more of them. And then if we can't, we have to be really mindful not to hurt that plant or know that it's going to be a big sacrifice. And you might not be, you might not get permission from that plant if it's the only one that's servicing that entire area. So we not, we try not to overburden the area which with we are harvesting. Uh, we make sure that we do it in a good way. Some of the elders would sing to the plants. Uh, they'd talk to the plants. I was taught to talk to the plants and really kind of form that connection that once you meet a plant, you will always see that plant. And remember that it's a living being that we are removing from this earth. Honey is one of those things that across the world, it is highly valued. And you know, it's like it's liquid sugar. Uh, but it has so much beneficial qualities to it. And so uh, that's why I added the picture here because everyone will recognize honey. 
When we harvest, we always remember to harvest in safe locations. We never want to endanger ourselves or to, to hurt ourselves or to cause any injury. We make sure we're never harvesting from busy roads that might have exhaust or insecticides, or if you're in Northern Ontario, where there might be salt that salts the roads, the wintry ice roads. Um, we, we try to leave those plants that are near the roads because they are doing the work of cleaning and, and recolonizing or colonizing that area. You'll see plants like mullein in North America growing on roads. Whatever plants grow on the sides of the roads, they're doing the work of cleaning. And they are doing the work of, of colonizing that land. So you'll see like if you leave a road for too long, all the plants start to like take over you leave if you know old cities and old towns and like in jungles they start to like disappear all the trees like take over it's because those trees are doing the work of taking back their territories they're they're building soil they're laying their lives down with each successive generation to to take that back and they heal the land they detoxify the land and they create new soil for those young ones that are are coming to provide seeds for the, uh, for the soil for the seeds. When we prepare, prepare our tea, we try to do use the best water that we can. Um, teapots, kettles, um, pots themselves. And we place that plant medicine very gently into that water and heat it not to, some other people have talked about the process of creating it so you don't um, hurt the, the medicines in that plant as you were, are trying to draw them out into your, into your water, waiting for that color change. And once you start to see that is to, to make sure you haven't heated the water too much. And we, we leave that water to steep. We leave that, those medicines. And we think about those medicines coming into that water. And, um, it was Adam and Zoe and Gabrielle, they talked about the kind of the nuances of thinking about that tea. And that's really important is we, we try to put those intentions and we try to think about what that water and that tea is doing because we wanna do it in a good way. And I've showed you know the copper kettle and the copper cups and I don't have my tea in here today, but we often use um, copper and I have my water in here. Uh, Anishinaabe women, we carry the water in our ceremonies in, in copper pails and copper uh, vessels. We are the keepers of the water. And so tea is really important to our women because we are the keepers of that water. Nibish in there, Nibish Shabo is, Nibish is the water and that's sister water and we protect her. So we choose uh, a vessel that is special to us. And here I have my blueberries. I told you blueberries are sacred to me because it represents Northern Ontario, Canada for me. It represents home. It represents the lands of my people. And copper has so many beneficial qualities. One is antimicrobial. And we believe as Anishinaabe people that, that copper has the ability, the spiritual ability to purify our water. And it carries our water in a good way. And it represents that relationship of honoring water, honoring the tea, honoring the plants that, that are in that water in a good way and, and honoring the, the knowledge that our ancestors accumulated over time of what plants to, to use, what plants to avoid. Here again, I have that Labrador tea plant. And when I make Labrador tea, I only use a few pieces of it and you don't, you don't steep that for too long. <laughs> you don't like make it heat up and you do not want it really, really like a potent tea. Labrador tea is, is something that you have a kind of a very nuanced relationship with. Um, it can, it can also, if it's too potent, you don't want to take too much of it. It's not at one you take too often. It can get a little toxic. <laughs> so you don't, you don't want to, you don't want to abuse this plant. Uh, and here in the picture, you can see some of the little fuzzies on the brownish underside of the plant that the hummingbirds would have gathered up. It appears more white, kind of a yellowy or an, like an, like an orangey white and um, you will see it and it lines inside of the hummingbird nest. So I think that's very special. When we drink the tea, we take our time, we think about it, we feel it, 
we think about how grateful we are for it. We, we are grateful for the land. We are grateful for the water. We are grateful for the vessel that, that carries that and holds that water and that tea in a good way. And when we are done, we return the whatever remains of the tea. And maybe it's a tea bag that you've used. Maybe that's all you have and that's good, that's good enough. However, you get your, meta, your, your plants, it's just to honor that plant. And so put it out on the land if you can, compost it if you can. But if we've picked some plant, we, we hand return it to the plant and lay it on the ground. Um, and so that the remains of the plant are treated in a sacred way, in a respectful way. And we honor that that gave up that life for us. And that's the end of my talk. So miigwech, chi miigwech, and um, thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Bedar. Now our speak speakers will take your questions. These will be posed by our moderator, Tiago Braga, who is a PhD candidate in the Department of Anthropology here at UC Davis. Hello. Adam, Renee, thank you so much for your very inspiring thoughts. It's always great to hear from fellow T scholars and the great frameworks that um, are being weaved in different ways of questioning the human relationship with T. So <clears throat> we have so many questions. I'm not sure we're gonna have time to go through all of them. Of course, there's a lot of praise pouring in for these very colorful, very interesting presentations, uh, but I'm gonna start with a question for Adam. Um, one of our attendees asks if um, were the herbs that you discussed in your presentation used in a more home setting or were they also utilized in quote unquote more formal and originized settings? Both. Thank you. That's a great question. And before I start, I just want to say thank you, Renee. Your talk was amazing. I want to catch up with you afterward. I have a lot of things to ask you about. And um, so, yeah, that was wonderful. Formal and informal. Um, the certainly depending on where you were in the Pale of Settlement and the era, um, the pharmacy was the 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 the, the, the uh, what they call the apotheca, the the apothecary was 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 the locus for a lot of medical knowledge for both trained and quote untrained practitioners, particularly the men. Um, there's a very good study called "You Will Find It in the Pharmacy" by a a scholar named Johann Petrovsky Stern, which was really illuminating for us as we were trying to sort of disentangle the so, so social relations that are obtained around around plants and plant uh, plant healing. Um, but certainly, most of the plants that we focused on in the book are are, are plants that can be wildcrafted. And um, again, as uh, the, to underscore the, the sort of the universality of a lot of the stuff, we we also focused on plants. We didn't talk about mullein, but we did. We talked about plantain, which has a very similar, the, the old English word way, um, you know, way broad. Um, it sort of attests to the fact that plantains like to grow under your feet, where, where a plantain is, it, it wants to be, it wants to be um, relied upon. Uh, but certainly wild strawberry, raspberry, most of these plants that were certainly found in the, in the, in the villages would be ones that were, um, uh, right, up, right, right alongside the road. Uh, St. John's word. The, the, the pepper. These are, uh, these are all plants that grow, grow wild. Um, they were also cultivated, and they were sort of dried and preserved and kept for sort of more precise um, pharmaceutical applications um, in the larger towns, which were, in many cases, um, uh, part of also part of the Jewish community. So. Thank you, Adam. Um... We're gonna follow with a question for Renee. Um, are some herbal medicines used in native communities in less rural areas? Uh, for example, does a mom pick up plants and medicines and teas for adult children um, visiting from homes in Toronto or Ottawa? Yeah, there is an... There is a, a plant expert from the West Coast on your area of the world. Uh, her name is Cease Weiss and she um, lives in the Vancouver area and she talks about urban uses of plants and she's brought, created like oases 
in the city, I don't know if oasis is, is the actual, <laughs> but like these little areas, these little protected areas where she's bringing traditional plant medicines in. And she gives all these workshops and uh, of people that, uh, of plants that people use and can use and identify in the city. I mean, you can walk around in most North American cities and see things like purslane and um, daisy, uh, dandelions, daisies, um, you know, like roses, wild roses are pretty tough. They'll show up everywhere, but you'll always see a dandelion popping up through somewhere or plantain. And in North America, we have two, we have an indigenous variety, which is like snake-like, but plantains everywhere. Like we, Anishinaabe people renamed plantain. We're like, you are so good. You are our brother now, <laughs> you know, like you, we, we use these in the cities too, because under every city is the earth. So it doesn't matter. It, our territory is always there. And so we are mindful that the impact of the city on those plants, but we honor and try to use those plants where we can, where like maybe in parks, well, strategically, gorilla style, um, you know, harvest plants in areas that are farthest away from the roads you know I've been in a park and like ooh, there's some stuff you know <laughs> there's some rose hips and like I I will I will take things and I'm probably not supposed to but I'm like this is this is my territory so I'm gonna do it <laughs> but so Toronto Ottawa doesn't matter Seattle you know it, New York you know you'll find plants I've been in New York there's like plants coming up all over the place and, but so we use it, but we're just mindful of where it is and what it, it's doing work of, of cleaning, right? So I don't want to take all that into me, but I will figure out places I can. And, and our people do, it's survival, you know, colonization keeps going. We can't stop. We just have to learn to adapt to survive. Thank you, Renee. Um, question for Adam. Um, during your research, have you come across any evidence um, of immigrants continuing the healing traditions that you discussed in the United States or in other countries in the Western Hemisphere? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. No, there was, um, this is kind of funny. We found an article that was published by a, 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 retired, a retired psychiatrist in South Florida in the early 80s. And you can tell that this guy was not really, you know, didn't know about human subjects research. He was interviewing his patients <laughs> about their, the remedies they brought with them from their, you know, elderly Jewish uh, retirees in, in Florida and the ones who would come over from Poland or the Soviet Union. And he was, and he asked them about what, what they'd kept with them. Um, we certainly, um, you know, uh, my co-author's uh, grandfather was um, the broader array of treatments um, was uh, uh, was uh, used uh, cups, cupping like traditional cupping, and had a, a a case of cups that he brought with him from Europe to the United States, and he had because he had, he had suffered TB, and so you know his regular he needed regular relied heavily on cupping to sort of um, treat his lungs. We also we interviewed a healer who lives in Jerusalem. I mean, you could, I could give you her phone number right now. She has a, a an American cell phone with a Brooklyn area code. Um, but you know, she'll, uh, she, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk to you on the phone and um, walk you through some of her uh, recommended treatments if you, depending on what, what ails you. So yes, a lot of the traditions were eradicated and we talk about it in the book. It's one of the, the many erasures of sort of, uh, of Jewish life in Europe. Uh, after the after the war, uh, especially indigenous knowledge, Jewish knowledge, women's knowledge, and also the broader culture of healing that um, was sort of left behind, you know, in the aftermath of the war. But there are still pockets, and one of the things that we've been really gratified to hear since the book came out was people who are really really excited about rediscovering um, their own traditions and and building on them, incorporating them into their own lives and their own their own their own practices. Thank you, Adam. And uh, <clears throat> jumping off from this this uh, question, which I, I want to proceed to a question for Renee, which I think is um, a little related, um, that also touches upon how these forms of engaging with plants are also forms of knowing and are also forms that travel. So I would like to read this question, which I think is quite interesting by one of our attendees, who says, quote, I trained as a herbalist here in the United States and was taught to ask for permission, bring offerings 
and thank the plants when harvesting. However, I always feel a bit awkward when I am part of a group of mostly white people who did not grow up with First Nation knowledge using these customs. How do you feel about it? I feel awkward too. <laughs> it gets a little awkward when you have to like also give an educational lesson um, <laughs> all the time um, or wondering what, what is she doing? She's doing some magical trick off in the on the side with like, woo, it's crazy. Um, but most of the time I know I'm gonna have to put my kind of educational hat on. I tell my students this who complain is like, why do I always have to educate everybody? I'm like, well, not everybody knows what you're doing. Um, and I, I oftentimes just say it's about whether you, you can just say thank you. It's about building a relationship beyond the, seeing a plant as a commodity, but seeing a plant as something that's there to act as, a, a, as like a partner in a relationship to help your life. And that all the things that are around us act in a larger ecosystem and a unison, unison of living. And um, it doesn't hurt you to say thank you. Just like we teach our children to say thank you because someone's giving you something that you did not have. And it, you know what? We don't know what a plant hears or feels or sees. That thank you is it might be for your own benefit, but it might hear you. And we don't know when we take, rip a plant out of the ground, if that's hurting it. And so our elders, you know, teach us like, you don't know these things. You can't, maybe someday someone will listen. I hear there's more and more devices you can stick on a tree and hear it talk and sing, which really freaks me out and makes me think of my salad in a whole other way. <laughs> but, you know, like, yeah, I feel uncomfortable, but I do it because, you know, that's ancestral knowledge and they did it because they knew like that's what they were told to do. That was a good way of acting. And I don't question that because that's research over generations upon generations of living in an ecosystem and understanding that they needed these things to rely upon. Renee, thank you for the very thoughtful answer. Um, I'd like to ask a question that is actually, I believe is directed to both of our speakers in this panel. And I'm gonna let Adam start. Um, can we say that herbal teas, including Camellia sinensis teas have been used as a medicine in history, especially in the cold regions in the world? Um, I don't know if I would be that prescriptive. Um, certainly, you know, tea, the, the homeland of tea is in, in regions that, you know, certainly in southern China and the Assam region of India, it's not, it's not, you know, it's, it's closer to tropical than not. Um, I, I, you know, hot, hot tea, hot camellia sinensis tastes really good. And by boiling, infusing, you know, the, 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 the leaves in boiling water, you're bringing out a lot of, a lot of the compounds that, you know, have a really positive effect on, 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 on the drinker. Um, but certainly, I'd say in general, if you live someplace where it's very cold, you probably want to drink. I drink more tea in the winter. And I live in Northern California where it's not even cold. I mean, I'm not, you know, I actually grew up in Kitchener, Renee, so I, I, I know a little bit about um, about about in a proper winter and lived in Minneapolis. So even, even so I've been in Northern California for so long now that uh, I find myself cold even here. But yeah, I, I wanna drink a, a warm beverage in, in the winter as opposed to the summer. No, so I don't think there's a correlation other than boiling, you know, hot beverages taste, you know, are, 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 are more, more, more attractive when you're cold. <laughs> Does Renee, do you want to add to this to this answer or should we proceed? Sorry, I was also trying to find information for people. So I might have missed all that except the Kitchener part. Um, but I was putting in the uh, chat box, I don't know if it came through, but Cease Weiss, even no matter what, but there's a great documentary on the National Film Board of Canada with Cease Weiss. She's called the Plant Diva. 
but she once you have the her name the spelling of her name you'll find her everywhere she has a traditional she's salish but i could be wrong um but um you can find her all over the place Sure. If you clarify the question, I probably could answer, but it's I couldn't multitask my uh, my brain here. No, oh, the question was uh, about whether uh, tea or herbal teas, including Camellia sinensis, uh, have been mostly used as medicines in cold regions of the world. Well, I can only speak for myself in the uh, minus 47.2 in my community recently. <laughs> but uh, we do, uh, I, I think, you know, people tend to drink a lot of tea and um, uh, coffee certainly has replaced things. It helps if you have small children and you need some caffeine. But um, I think the tea is, was a, is a survival and it, it's not a was. I don't wanna put indigenous knowledge into the was category. It is very important. And when I was um, recently, as of 2020, when I was working up there at Nipissing University, which is in North Bay, Ontario, Canada, I had a lot of Cree students from way up north. And they would like literally bring me bags of Labrador tea and then a big chunk of moose meat. So, <laughs> you know, like they're, they're the, the, the language of appreciation and love is a bag of medicine and a big piece of moose meat, well, you know, and like, or, or hides or something. And so it, it's very much ingrained into the culture that in the winter time, you drink your Labrador tea or your cedar tea. And in the summer you collect like crazy, all the other stuff so that in the winter you can have those as well. Winter time is the land of tea is the time of tea. Great. Um, we have time for one more question. Um, I'm going to direct this one to Renee again. Um, someone asks if, um, is there a way to harvest the root of a plant without killing it, if that is possible? Well, it's a yes and no. It depends on the plant. I mean, like you, everyone's tried to pull out dandelions out of the lawn. And that is a losing battle. It, it, you think you got it and it, it's like, no, it's back again. It's like, haha, it's a big joke. It's like, it, there's a little bit of trickster in every dandelion. I think there's like a healthy dose um, to especially to terrorize the old white men who want their lawn to be like perfect. You know, I always laugh. I don't cut the lawn that much. I always like the white clover and the dandelions and uh, what's the other one? Dead nettle and, and uh, heal all to just go crazy in the lawn. And it drives my neighbors nuts. But so like those kind of things, they're really resistant, but there's some fragile ones that if you start digging them up, you have to know that that is probably the last time that plant's gonna grow there because they're ju it's just too fragile. And it also means that that medicine too is, is you know, very special. You know, there's some that you can and there's some that you can't. You, you have to you have to know that plant before you make that commitment, because either you're going to steward it to maybe come back. Maybe you're going to collect seeds to bring it back. Um, my my great aunt Albina used to have a leak patch, wild leaks, ramps, as they call them. And she wouldn't tell anyone where that was because she didn't want anyone to know, because now they're like endangered throughout North America. But like she would steward that plant because she didn't want anyone to threaten that plant, even though leaks are really hard to get rid of. <laughs> um, they, you know, like you have to be, you have to have a, a mindfulness is the, the word of the day about what your actions are going to do. Even any tea you consume, you should be mindful before you put the body. Don't, don't put it in your body just because someone thinks it's cool or someone shows up with a pot of something. We don't, we try to teach, don't put something in your body that you don't have a relationship with because that, that could be dangerous. You don't know what your reactions are going to be. I don't know if that answers it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we did run out of time for more questions. There are more questions. The talks were so fascinating, um, I'm sure. And I myself would love to have an hours long conversation with all of the the presenters in this great colloquium, but um, we are going to 
Uh, first of all, thank you, Adam and Renee, for this great panel. And we are going to take a break for lunch now. And uh, we will be back in one hour. Thank you.